see if I can get my share going for us. Okay, so we are continuing our look at the connection between the book of Zechariah and the first four seals of Revelation chapter six. And we're still in Zechariah chapter five. And where we have this flying roll that is flying in the midst of heaven. And it had dimensions, 20 cubits by 10 cubits, which are the same dimensions as Solomon's porch um, in the temple where we find the pillars of Jachin and Boaz. Jachin connected with the tribe of Levi and the priesthood and Boaz connected with the tribe of Judah and the kingship. And we see this flying scroll that's written on both sides. We saw as God's law, which for those who are transgressing God's law, it's a curse. Of course, God's law is a blessing to all who receive it as such. Um, but here in this judgment process in the time of the coronation of the king, where he's receiving his testimony together with the anointing, which we saw in Zechariah 4, and the crown, which we'll see in Zechariah chapter 6. And we saw the two tables of stone represented by him who swears falsely in the Lord's name and the thief who enters the house. And we've been looking at some testimonies of God's spirit. And I had a couple more testimonies to wrap up before we moved on. And so let's take a look at those together this evening. The first one is taken from the book of education. Page 144, paragraph two. From the book of education, 144. Paragraph two. Actually, we're starting at 143, paragraph five. And testimony of Jesus tells us, he that getteth riches and not by right shall leave them in the midst of his days and at his end shall be a fool. Quoting Jeremiah 17:11. continues the accounts of every business the details of every transaction past the scrutiny of unseen auditors agents of him who never compromises with injustice never overlooks evil never palliates wrong so the context here we see the the title of this section of education is called caused business principles and methods and here's honest business dealings is the subsection that we're in and here we have the veil drawn back for us to see that god sees all and there's nothing in the slightest detail of which he is unaware or with which he is not concerned. The next paragraph, if thou seest the oppression of the poor and violent perverting of judgment and justice, marvel not at the matter, for he that is higher than the highest regarded. There is no darkness, no shadow of death where the workers of iniquity may hide themselves. 
quoting from Ecclesiastes 5a and Job 34.22. We see here the corrupt and selfish dealings of men being spoken of, being done in darkness, and yet the highest, the most high, regards he sees and he will deal with it next paragraph they set their mouth against the heavens and they say how doth god know and is there knowledge in the most high these things hast thou done god says and i kept silence Thou thoughtest that I was altogether such a one as thyself, but I will reprove thee and set them in order before thine eyes. Quoting from Psalm 73, 9 to 11, and Psalm 50, verse 21. So do we see, we see a pattern here of the, uh, the description that's being given to us of how God regards such things. Dishonesty. Selfish dealing. You see the mindset revealed of those who who question whether God really knows since he does, seems to do nothing about it. To the point that we come to think of God as being like one of us. But we're reminded here that we're, we're dealing with the Most High and not just any old man. And it's that context in which she transitions here to Zechariah chapter 5. I turned and I lifted up my eyes and I looked and behold a flying roll. This is the curse that goeth forth over the face of the whole earth. For everyone that stealeth shall be cut off as on this side according to it. And everyone that sweareth shall be cut off as on that side according to it. I will bring it forth, saith the Lord of hosts, and it shall enter into the house of the thief, and into the house of him that sweareth falsely by my name, and it shall remain in the midst of his house, and it shall consume it with the timber thereof and with the stones thereof. Quoting from Zechariah 5, 1 through 4. And then here comes an explanation of the passage. Against every evildoer, God's law utters condemnation. He may disregard that voice. He may seek to drown its warning, but in vain. It follows him. It makes itself heard. It destroys his peace. If unheeded, it pursues him to the grave. It bears witness against him at the judgment. A quenchless fire, it consumes at last soul and body. Any thoughts? What do we take from this passage? Um, it seems as though she's talking about... Uh, and, and this whole thing is connecting, you know, man's um, corruption. Hmm. Corrupt dealings, dishonesty, um, and warnings that are given against it. Can I make it maybe a little bit simpler? Did you ever do something... And you just kept thinking, why did I do that? And it just bugged you for like, 
years and years. And maybe <laughs> you did something. I remember something I did to a girl that was disabled when I was in school, when I was maybe six years old. And I have prayed for forgiveness, but that bugs me to this day. There are just things that just stay with me. And I remember that I did wrong for a long, a long time. I pray for it and I pray for forgiveness. And I know I'm forgiven, but just the memory of things that I've done, just f sort of, they're always in the back of my mind. Why did I do that? And it just reminds me, don't be that person anymore. It just, a little reminder, don't be that person. It's, that's what that, when you read that, that's what that was reminding of. It just, it's going to be with you forever and ever and ever, unless you pray for it not to be with you anymore. Okay, we, we see here in the passage that there's, there's uh, an issue that it follows you everywhere forever if you disregard that voice. So if we regard that voice, is it gonna follow us forever? No, no. Okay. So this is talking about those that, that stifle the conviction that what they've done is wrong. And that there's no, that it's in vain to do so. There's zero benefit from stifling the conviction. It will continue to follow and catch up with you, for sure, eventually. But there's good news still. This is God doesn't just have this law that condemns us. What shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Mark 8, 36 and 37. So again, this is in the context of the this flying scroll, the scroll flying in the midst of heaven. In a time of judgment. In the time of the coronation of the king, the anointing of the king. You know, we're told this is a question that demands our consideration by demands consideration by every parent, every teacher, every student, by every human being, young or old. No scheme of business or plan of life can be sound or complete that embraces only the brief years of this present life and makes no provision for the unending future. Let the youth be taught to take eternity into their reckoning. Let them be taught to choose the principles and seek the possessions that are enduring, to lay up for themselves that treasure in the heavens that faileth not, where no thief approacheth, nor neither moth corrupteth, to make to themselves friends by means of the mammon of unrighteousness, that when it shall fail, these may receive them into the eternal tabernacles. A reference to Luke 12, 33 and Luke 16, 9. So what, what is this flying scroll supposed to draw our attention to? God's displeasure with us. Okay. That's a little bit focusing on the negative side of what's being said here, but okay. I was more looking for eternal things as opposed to temporal things in a broad sense is, is what she's talking about here that we ought to take eternity into account as we make our choices of everything we're doing, including business transactions. 
seemingly everyday secular activities need to have a mindset of a consideration of eternal things based on principle. And not policy. So as this message is going forth, a testimony. Excuse me. Yes, my just, brother. Shouldn't that just be in in life in general? You should do it in life in general. Not. You should always just consider everything you do because. I mean, if you, how do I explain this? It's sort of like, never mind, never mind. It's, it's, it the just short answer is like, yes. Yeah, it just seems like some people do How many people things. are doing it? Not many. Not, not many. many. That's why it needs attention brought to it. Because so few are actually considering things in light of eternity. And God desires that a testimony might be given in the end that can be seen by all that calls attention to eternal realities. And by our, our choices not to engage in an unfair, business practices like most people in this life that god will use that to draw attention to people to eternal realities i think there's also an implication in here that we are being watched by god absolutely and there's nowhere and no thing that he does not see <laughs> i know <laughs> It's amazing. There's no thought that he does not read. Right. Continues, all who do this are making the best possible preparation for the life in this world. No man can lay up treasure in heaven without finding his life on earth, thereby enriched and ennobled. Godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that is now, and of that which is to come from first timothy 4 8. so when we we make decisions based on eternal realities and not just what can be physically seen and discerned is that only good for the future life No, I think it's good for the present, too, because, um, I mean, we're doing what's right in the present, and what you do in the present um, has a connection to the future, too, as well. Yeah. Because Absolutely. Because it's, it's not just, hopefully, it's not just our present, hopefully... It's for the present and the future of the person you're doing it for, or the person that sees you doing it. So it's it's not just for you, it's for others that see you doing it. Yes, amen. Yeah. And even for ourselves, when we when we make a right choice in a particular situation, is it easier or harder to make that? right choice the next time that situation arises. To pray that it's easier. Easier, yes. The more that you walk along the same route, you, uh, uh, you know, a path develops where it's, it's a little bit easier to travel on than going through the wild bush. And the same with our, the, same with our, our neural connections. The more we, we choose right, the easier it is for us to choose right. 
And, and conversely, the more we make wrong choices, the easier it becomes for us to make more wrong choices. So the ones who make the right choices now receive a blessing now, not just a future blessing. You see, there's an enriching and ennobling that comes from godliness. While it is preparing us for a future life, a life with a future. So these eternal realities and enduring principles, God is looking for them to become these ideas and concepts to become prominent in these last days through us, using us to bring that message, that testimony, that flying scroll, the epistle known and read of all men, that he can save to the uttermost. That connection with him leads to transformation and blessing. Okay, and we had one other testimony I wanted to look at. Unless there's some more thoughts about that. Second one is taken from letter 123 from 1904. And beginning on paragraph 22, we have a section here entitled Living for Christ. Living for Christ. Someone want to read that first paragraph for us? Who can? See it on the screen. Okay. One thing we must not forget, that in order for our character building to be pleasing to God, we must constantly advance in spirituality. <clears throat> we must regard as worthless anything that lessens faith and confidence in our Redeemer. The more light there is shining into our souls, the greater the demand upon us to reflect that light to others. God desires you to let your light shine forth to the world. He will be glorified in our individual reflection of his character amen all right what, what do you take away from that brother that the less we are the more he is that we have to let him shine through us for mm -hmm. others to see okay amen and that one thing we must remember pleasing to God and it's pleasing to God because he wants to shine he wants his light to shine through us hmm. and he wants us and he wants us to be his light to shine and let other people see him through us can we stand still and remain pleasing to God when you say stand still you mean just like locked in a closet, you mean? No. Spiritually. No. Okay. We have to we have to grow and be with him and learn and from him. 
Okay, we must constantly advance in spirituality for our character building to be pleasing to God. I think that's pretty important for us to, to recognize. Now, question, when you say, uh, wait, in order for a character building to be pleasing to God, we must constantly advance in spirituality. But when you read the Bible and you pray, is that part of, is that what he's looking for? Or does that include helping others and teaching others? Can you just expand on that a little? What do you think? I have it's an idea. All of it. It's all of it. All of it? Is that what you said? That's what David said. I'm not sure. That's what yeah, I'm asking. I think it's all of it. Okay. I think, I mean, if I pray from my heart and I study and I read the Bible and I try and teach others what, uh, if I try, I don't try anything. If God teaches, if God lets me his voice come through me and to others there's nothing i don't know much more i can that can be done for me so i think that's that's most of it i don't know anything else i can do but i have faith okay um if we if we were, say you were to focus on one, you know, important part of spirituality, say prayer, you're going to, I'm going to really pray fervently all the time and more than I used to, but you're not focusing on other important areas so that you're not balanced. Do you think that's pleasing to God? Or does he want balanced Christians? I, he wants balanced Christians. Balanced it develop, development. Regardless of what I'm praying for and trying to help others with my prayers. Amen. So we have, you know, in the, the sanctuary, in the, whole, in, in the holy place, what furniture do we have in the holy place? The showbread. Okay. On the right, the yes. incense in the center. Okay. On the left is the candlesticks. Okay. Candlestick, sorry. And so the showbread represents 12 tribes. Okay. What else? What does the bread represent? Jesus, I okay. think. Okay. Specifically, the word. The word of God is the bread of heaven. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you gotta be you gotta be consuming God's word and 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 chewing it and breaking it down and having it become a part of you. That's part of your growing in spirituality that is pleasing to God. Okay. And we have the incense where we have our prayers mingled with his righteousness. Mm -hmm. So being in communication with God in prayer continually throughout the day and at special times of the day set aside for prayer uh, is a way we can be building our characters in a way that's pleasing to God and advancing in spirituality. And indeed, yes, the candlestick represents holy. What's holy that? Ghost. The Holy Ghost. Okay. And also, what comes from a candlestick? Light. 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 Okay. And when we receive that light and we reflect it to others, that's our witness for God, right? Mm -hmm. all, all that we do to witness to others, that's the candlestick, the work of the candlestick, which also is a way we can be advancing in spirituality and character building that's pleasing to God.
What else? There was a laver of water. What did you do with the laver of water? Washed. Washed. So we can be clean. Wa being washed and being made clean continually as part of our advancing in spirituality. As, as we're convicted of more and more ways that we're unlike Jesus, we can be going through that process of willingly giving up our sins at the altar, a burnt offering to be consumed by the fire and washing in the labor, consuming his word and praying and witnessing. But we can't ever think that we've arrived. We must be constantly advancing in spirituality. Brother, there's a sentence in this paragraph that um, it might seem kind of benign, but I think it's very important when it says, we must regard as, work, as worthless anything that lessens faith and, co and confidence in our Redeemer. And I think that we are surrounded by things that lessen faith and in co in, in confidence in our Redeemer. We're mm. being bombarded by it every day in the form of distractions. And do, we um, and do we consider those things to have value or to be worthless? We, we, we need to consider them to be worthless. The more we grow spiritually, the more we will consider them to be worthless. Amen. Because we'll see it for yeah. ourselves. Um, but these things, these, there are things that, the things that lessen faith and confidence um, they are very powerful, and they are getting more powerful as <clears throat> as time goes on. Yes. And I see that. I believe I'm given to see that. Um, but I also know that the more, when we get in touch with God through prayer and Bible study, um, these things become less important to us because we see them for what they are. Anything that lessens faith and confidence in our Redeemer. Mm -hmm. and we see as we advance in spirituality, we'll be gaining more light, yes? Oh, absolutely. But with that more light comes greater... Responsibility. Responsibility. The greater the demand upon us to reflect that light to others. See, God desires you to let your light shine forth to the world. We can't make our light shine forth to the world. We have to let the light shine. Because we're reflecting the light. But it takes a certain, it takes a certain amount of growth. I mean, we have to eventually grow and then and to acquire the spirit and grace from the Lord. And as we grow, um, God will, we will be ready to receive the, that grace from God to be able to do those things. I think we have to be, we've got to be ready to receive it, brother. I mean, we can't do it of ourselves. Um, the light has to be shining on you in order for you to reflect it, yeah? Yes. You can't, be, you can't be standing in the darkness and reflecting the light at the same time. Right. And when we do reflect the light, he is glorified. We have that promise here. Does yeah, someone want to read this next paragraph? Yeah, I'll read it. I greatly desire that you shall have an ambition to live a life that will make others better, a life which will show that Christ is formed within, the hope of glory. I greatly desire that you shall be able to say with the Apostle Paul, oh, I live, oh my, I live, yet not I, 
Mm. But Christ liveth in me. Oh my. In perfect, in perfect content, resting in the love of Christ, trusting the Redeemer and life giver to work out for you the salvation of your soul. You will know as you draw nearer and still nearer to him what it means to endure the seeing of him who is invisible. God desires us to rest content in his love. The contentment that Christ bestows is a gift worthy infinitely more than gold and silver and precious, mm, precious stones. Amen. You know, I um, see, I was, I was kind of surprised when I saw that um, I, I, because um, I just saw that today in, in the Bible. And that's one of the things that I wanted to commit to memory. Hmm. And now I see it here. Amen. Can I ask? I live, yet not I. Yes, by Chris. That's what I was going to mention. Is that sort of like giving yourself up and letting Christ live in you? That's what I thought when I heard that. I live, yet not I, but Christ live within me. That's giving yourself up and letting him take control of you. Well, the verse continues, the, I live, yet not I, but Christ live within me. And the life that I now live, live. I live by the live. faith of the Son of God, God, who loved me and gave himself, and gave for, himself me. for me. Yes. So, yeah, yeah. so it's a, a life that's lived by faith. But it's Christ who's living in us and through us as a consequence of that faith. So we see, again, this is going to be in the, connected with this flying scroll where we've seen already up to this point, we're talking about how this flying scroll is bringing this, this condemnation on the transgressor of God's law. But do you see, do you see any condemnation in this paragraph that we're reading? No, no, I don't. No, it's it's a it, it's more like an exhortion. Repeatedly, she's talking about ref, resting perfectly content in the love of Christ, content in His love, resting content in His love, and this is how the. This testimony will go forth that flies in the midst of heaven and will be seen is when Christ is formed within the hope of glory. And we say, I live, but not, not I, but Christ liveth in me. And we rest perfectly content in his love. Living out is love. Love is the fulfilling of the law. But we need to desire it. We need to have an ambition to live a life that will make others better. And how, how much is that uh, gift of contentment from Christ worth? What would you pay for it? Uh, the earthly life, the fleshly life. A gift worthy infinitely more than gold and silver and precious stones. In perfect contentment, resting in the love of Christ, trusting the redeemer and life giver to work out for you the salvation of your soul. And what does that look like? You will know as you draw nearer and still nearer to him, what it means to endure the seeing of him who is invisible.
See how all the focus is on Christ here. The testimony, the scroll that's flying, the flying scroll is a testimony of Jesus. It's the testimony of Jesus living in us. Manifesting through us. It will lead us to rest content in his love. How about the next paragraph? Someone want to read that? Um, love, delight, love and right because it is right. Okay, like love the right because it is right and analyze your feelings, your imper imperfections in the light of the word of God. Misdirected ambition will lead you into sorrow as surely as you yield to it <clears throat> i am trying to catch the way words and expressions that were made in re re reference to this matter and as my pen hesitates a moment the appropriate words come to mind i want i want you to understand me cherish and and vision that will bring glory to God because it is specified by the Holy Spirit. Sanctified. Thank you. Let me try that again. Cherish the ambition that will bring glory to God because it is sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Let the holy oil which comes from two olive branches burn with the holy radiance upon the altar of your soul. The work of these olive branches represents the riches impartation. Imp what does that mean? Impartation means like to impart, to give, giving. Okay. The work of these olive branches represents the riches impartation of the Holy Spirit, Zacharias says. Okay, we'll pause there. So what, what are your thoughts about this paragraph? Anything stand out? First thing that I thought was interesting is love the right because it is the right and analyze the things and the impressions in the light of the word. Just, I think that's important because sometimes we, we say things half cocked and we don't listen to the word of God and we do things not really thinking about what we, what the Bible says we should do, and we just do things from what we think we should do. Maybe I misunderstood what I read. Well, it, it seems like it's like she's admonishing us to have um, spiritual ambitions and an ambition ambition for spirituality uh, mm -hmm. rather than rather than worldly ambition, which is all around us. In which we're, which any, you know, the, a person of the world is very susceptible to it. And why, why does she tell us to analyze our feelings and our impressions? Well, because um, in analyzing our feelings and impressions, it, it has a reflection on our motives. I think we can learn about our own motives, whether they be good or bad or honest or, or whatever. I, I'm sorry, go ahead. You go ahead. But didn't, 
Gina, you say that um, emotions and feelings and things like that, we should try to <clears throat> not, not eliminate, but keep under control because with emotions and feelings and things like that, that will lead us in a direction that we shouldn't be going in. Well, yeah, that's why she says analyze them and yeah. watch them. She doesn't say follow them. She says analyze them. Okay. Think about what's your motivation. That what what's causing those feelings? Where what's the source of those impressions? Where and we're we're analyzing them in the light of the Word of God. So I take my feelings and my impressions, and then I compare them with the Word of God. And I also think about: Am I loving the right because it's right, or am I loving something else? for any other reason. Are, are, we even, are we even, brother, am I loving the right for a bad motive? You know, am I just sort of going through the motions? That's right. For, for, because I want others to think I'm great or, mm -hmm. or something, That's you know, pie, you know, like a, a pious hypocrite. That's right. We see our feelings and our impressions can lead to misdirected ambition, which always will lead into sorrow as surely as you yield to it. But we should not be like Vulcans and not have any emotions or feelings at all, should we? No, she doesn't. She doesn't say to not have feelings. God created feelings and God speaks to us through impressions that he God wants. has feelings what's that God has feelings God himself has feelings that's right but does God ever allow his feelings to sway him where he violates right principles no he cannot do it even when he's angry and really frustrated Yes. Mm, even when his anger waxes hot? I would say yes, because yes. there is righteousness involved in that. Mm. There's a righteousness beyond our, what our finite minds can understand. So God has feelings, but he keeps them under the control of his, his will. By exercising his will, his, his higher faculties control those feelings and impressions and keep them in line with righteousness. And that's an ability that God desires to impart to us through his Holy Spirit, the holy oil. See, she twice talks about ambition here. She makes a, a contrast between a misdirected ambition. And then here she says, cherish an ambition that will bring glory to God because it is sanctified by the Holy Spirit. So she doesn't say it's wrong to have ambition. She says, cherish an ambition that will bring glory to God. <clears throat> She doesn't say be purposeless, you know, lacking ambition, because that's prideful. No, there can be a form of ambition that's prideful. But there's also an ambition for the glory of God. That's right to desire. It has to be sanctified by the Holy Spirit. And she goes on to quote from Zechariah directly, first from chapter four here in the next paragraph, Zechariah 4, 11 to 14, then answered I and said unto him, what are these two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick and upon the left side thereof? And I answered again and said unto him, what be these two olive branches, which through the two 
golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves. He answered me and said, knowest thou not what these be? And I said, no, my Lord. And then he said, then said he, these are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. Then I turned, the prophet continues, and I lifted up mine eyes and looked and behold a flying roll. And he said unto me, what seest thou? And I answered and I see a flying roll. Excuse me, the length thereof is 20 cubits and the breadth thereof 10 cubits. Then he said unto me, this is the curse that goeth forth over the face of the whole earth. For everyone that stealeth shall be cut off as on this side, according to it. And everyone that sweareth shall be cut off as on that side, according to it. And I will bring it forth, saith the Lord of hosts, and it shall enter into the house of the thief and into the house of him that sweareth falsely by my name. And it shall remain in the midst of his house. And it shall consume it with the timber thereof and with the stones thereof. Every evil worker will receive at God's hand according to his works. So everything up until that last line was a direct quote from Zechariah. And then she adds, every evil worker will receive at God's hand according to his works. And then she turns back to the idea of ambition. Someone want to read this next paragraph for us? Brother David? Okay. <clears throat> I want your ambition to be a sanctified ambition <clears throat> so that angels of God can inspire your heart with holy zeal, leading you to move forward steadily and solidly and making you a bright and shining light. Your perceptive faculties will increase in your will increase in power and soundness in your whole being, body, soul, and spirit is consecrated to the accomplishment of a holy work. Make every effort in and through the grace of Christ to attain to the high standard, um, yeah, to attain to the high standard before you. You can, you can be perfect in your sphere as God is perfect in his sphere. Has not Christ declared be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Amen. Any thoughts? Things that stuck out to you? Well, yeah, this is this is a um, it's an exhortion to um, to be faithful in what you know is right, and to just keep going forward. Okay. To go forward and, and to make every effort through Christ. And, okay. and it can only be done really by his grace. And because that's done in, in everything, mm -hmm. um, from the biggest things, even to the smallest things, depending upon what kind of a person you are. Um, you know, what kind of a person you are in strength or in weakness. Um, you may need God's grace just to do the simplest things hmm. that would make another person laugh at you. So um, this is definitely, yes, an exhortion Amen. to go forward. So being faithful doesn't mean just sitting there being faithful. Being faithful actually involves moving forward steadily and solidly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes. You trying to tell us something, brother? <laughs> I'm just reading the testimonies. <laughs> I know. It speaks to me just as much, brother. And we see, like you noted very correctly, uh, even though it's all in and through his grace, that doesn't mean, again, that we just sit back and let him do it. Because make every effort. Yeah, there's cooperation. We must cooperate. Yes, I know. I know. Something that we do makes it possible, yet we still have to do everything that we can. Yo, yes. Oh, yeah. God won't and can't do his part until we do. I have yes. a question. If um, if I want to, if, to help myself, you know, to 
cleanse my body from toxins and things like that. I should fast. And when I fast, I get closer to God. And that is, is that part of what it's saying there? I cannot make myself perfect. God, I have to give myself to God and let him make me perfect. But I have to be willing to give myself to God and let him make me perfect. But I can't do that. I have to say, God, here, this is, this is me. This is who I am. I'm going to do all the things that I can do to get to know you. I have faith in you. I have to be the best that you want me to be and you do with me what you wish. But I, ha it's like, like you guys were saying, it's a cooperation because I can't sit and say, okay, I'm going to be perfect now. He ha you have to, it's a two-way street. I have to do things and say, God, here, I want you to help me to do these things. And I, I'm going to, you know, read my Bible and I'm going to pray and I'm going to do all the things that I know that you want me to do. And I have faith that you're going to, to be with me. So it's not like I'm just going to sit and say, okay, here I am, just change me. It doesn't work that way. Well, maybe, even, maybe. even though it does say here, make every effort, it does not say make yourself therefore perfect. What's, what's the verb connected with being perfect? You can be perfect in your spirit as God is. What about the next line? The um, quoting scripture. Yes. Be therefore perfect. Doesn't say make ye therefore yourself perfect. It says be perfect. Be, that's just existing. Uh, the flower doesn't make itself grow. It just is. But God made it that way. But God made it that way. And as it grows, it's growing just the way God made it to grow. Right. So I have to pray that, that God makes me, gets rid of my sin so I can be perfect again. No? Yes, maybe. Well, we have to let him do it. But we have to make every effort that we can make in and through the grace of Christ. Never on our own making effort. Yet making, striving with every fiber of our being as much as we can <laughs> to, to cooperate even though that's going to be infinitely short of what needs to be done. And he has to, to make up the, the great gulf between what we've done and what needs to be done. Yet he wants us to make that every effort. And it's, it's important that we do. It's part of this cooperation process. Uh, she continues explaining more in the next paragraph. Well, you want to read that for us, Brother Chris? Okay. You are not to regard yourself as merely a passive recipient. recipient of the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. God has entrusted you precious talents, and he requires the improvement of these talents. Inter interest from the principal lent is his due. You are to be a worker together with him, submitting your will to his will. You will improve in speech and in spiritual concepts. You will be enabled to give the people you will be able, enabled to give the people through your prayerful efforts that which God has given you. Okay, amen. What stands out to you here? I think the first sentence, you are not 
to regard yourself as merely a passive recipient of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. You are to you are entrusted with the precious talents. He is giving them to you, but you have to be willing to let him work through you. You can't just say, okay, here, and he's given it. You and him have to work together mm. to, to do this. You can't say, oh, I'm just going to do this and do that, and the heck with God. And how, and how, does, she, and how does she how describe does she what it looks like to work together? together? Submitting your will to his will. Mm, that's interesting. Is that, that what, is that what we usually think of as our work? If you if God, you're thinking God, I want to do something to work for God. Is submitting your will to His will the first thing you think of as a work to do for Him? Not usually. Yeah, yeah no, usually not. Really. No. But we see that's actually what 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 working together with Him looks like. It starts with submitting our will to His will. Then she also says it involves looking to him prayerfully to, and, and he will enable us to give others what he's given to us. So just giving what you've received is also part of being a worker together with him. Now it doesn't say you have to give people what you haven't received, right? True. So you don't have to worry if you haven't received something, that's okay, because then you're not required to give it. You're only, he's only looking to you to give to others that which you yourself have received. And that's then, true. And then okay. when we pray for others and you want to give to others what you've received, as long as you're submitting your will to his, he will enable you to do it. And I ask, and this is more of a statement for me. I, when I pray, I, when I try and help others, I want to give them a trillion dollars when I have five dollars. And I feel guilty when I can't. And it makes me upset. And that's just my mind's acting. Why can't I help? this and this and this person why can't they have you know an apartment why can't they have what i have and that's just my brain and that makes me feel like what did i do wrong that i couldn't help them is that makes sense and and that makes me feel depressed and it shouldn't because but is, god but has is, is money what they really need no but it's okay. just but that's how my brain works. Why can't I help them? You know, that's what my brain keeps thinking. Why are they so? And I'm not, if that makes sense. And it's just. You already have a, a, a priceless treasure that they do need, brother. Right? I you, don't, you, don't, you don't have a, a full bank account, but you have a priceless treasure. You know the Lord, right? Mm -hmm. and his word so you Christ. have something to give them ask god how to help you be able to give them what he's given you okay. remember see you're not you're not supposed to give them what he hasn't given you he hasn't given you money so you don't have to give them money mm -hmm. he wants you to give them what you have remember this is talking about how we can be perfect in our sphere, as he's perfect in his. It involves submitting our will to his will. And giving that which God has given to you. And then you've done what he, he's asked of you. Now you can pray and ask him to give you more. Is that possible? Of course you can. And then you submit your will to his will. 
okay. about whether he actually gives you more or how he gives you more or what he okay. gives you more of. Okay. Trusting that that's his will. And I know I'm talking way too much, and I apologize. No, it's, praise the Lord. So I think we often think we need to do more than something more in order to be right with God, but we're often not looking at it through the right lens of what he's really looking from us. that would be most pleasing to him. Uh, Brother David, you wanna read the next paragraph for us? Yes. <clears throat> you are carefully, you are carefully to guard the powers of the mind. Your thoughts are to be kept under the control of the Holy Spirit. You are never to forget the words, we are laborers, together with God. Ye, ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. It is your work to advance toward perfection, making constant improvement until at last you are pronounced worthy to receive immortal life. And even then the work of progression will not cease, but will continue throughout eternity. Mm. Yeah, that's a pretty powerful paragraph. Yes. Yeah, so we are, we Excuse are. Me, Brother David, mm -hmm. can you do me a favor? Read yes. the first three, two or three sentences one more time. Yes, I will. Uh, you are carefully to guard the powers of the mind. Your thoughts are to be kept under the control of the Holy Spirit. You are never to forget the words. We are laborers together with God. Hmm. Uh, we're carefully to guard the powers of the mind. And that's a, a pretty loaded statement. Do we carefully guard the powers of the mind? Well, I know I, when I'm not in prayer, I don't. I don't. Um, I indulge in very unholy thoughts, which only leads to more and more um, indulgence of, you know, of more bad emotions and feelings and eventually actions. Um, I, it's much more easier, much more easier uh, to guide our minds when we are in prayer and we have the Holy Spirit with us because it's the Holy Ghost that helps us and um, corrects us when our minds start to go in another direction. If we don't stay connected to Christ, we're not gonna be able to carefully guard the powers of our mind. And I, I know that. That's right. She doesn't say your thoughts are to be kept under your, under, you're to keep your own thoughts under control. It's not what she says. Right. She says your thoughts are to be kept under the control of the Holy Spirit. That's right. And, but that can't happen if we don't avail ourselves to the Holy Spirit, if we don't take the time to avail ourselves in prayer and pray for the grace for that Holy Spirit. And yield our will to his will. Yes. Can I ask, okay, if I listen to religious music for like two hours after I pray and read the Bible, so my mind is not on watching YouTube, is would that be good? Because my mind is still on, not on earthly things. Would that be something that would help? Well, sure, though YouTube isn't necessarily wrong. It depends on what you're watching on YouTube. That's okay. right. That's true, but you get my point. But if I not, if I'm listening to religious music, and not on you know doing something, you know on on TV or, or something idiotic. 
Amen. Wicked imaginings is something that God hates. He does not like wicked imagination. Um, that's one of the seven things that God hates. I saw that. I read it for myself in the Bible. An, an heart that devises wicked imagination is something that God hates. He despises that. He doesn't like it. Well, he sees the, the consequence of it. Oh, he sees the consequence, and he also sees the, the ambitions of the wicked heart. Mm -hmm. And um, that is disappointing to him um, when we manifest um, it within our minds thoughts that give place to self-exaltation. That is very, that's a very prominent sin, brother, in my life. Mm -hmm. I, oh, I guess I just said, I just, I guess confessed something. Um, but it is, that's a very prominent sin. Okay, we're, to, we're to advance toward perfection, making constant improvement. Yes. Hmm. And that will never have arrived because uh, even once we're to heaven, the progression will never cease, but will continue throughout eternity. My brother, does the atonement occur? when Jesus comes, or does it occur when we receive the Holy Spirit? Oh. <laughs> well. Because something has to give, give us the stamp. I mean, Jesus has to give us the stamp of authentication at some point. Um, Jesus must authenticate us. And it seems like that from what I've read, it's when it's when Jesus comes and he, he looks at one and says, well done. And he looks at the other and says, go away from me. I never knew you. That kind of seems like the authenticating of who's who um, when that happens. And that's kind of like the, the judgment or a judgment that Jesus is making when well, he can't win at the second sealing advent. work that's being done. The sealing work involves God putting his seal of approval on us, you, you know, taking his signet ring as it were, and putting the impression of that signet ring on us. That this is mine. It's under my dominion. So maybe it's a process where there's steps. Well, there is a process. I mean, the, the work of atonement is a process of restoring us to be fully back one with God. I mean, the Bible tells us that, that Jesus made an atonement for us on the cross. And yet he's doing a work of atonement for us now on the day of atonement. Yeah. We're, we're told about the, the final work of cleansing on the Day of Atonement. And th th there, there's an aspect of the uh, atonement that will be brought to perfect completion in our day, prior to the second coming, uh, right up to the close of probation. But we don't know when Yet that even is. Then, with the, what, what's going to happen for the thousand years and the millennium up until through the, the third coming and the, the great white throne judgment, that, that's the final work of atonement. Uh, you know, ju just like a plant is, you know, you know, when the seed blossoms and that first sprout comes up, that sprout's just a little tiny sprout, but it's perfect. It's just the way God made it to be. And then as it grows, it gets bigger and starts to get leaves and it's still not fully mature, yet it's perfect. It's just the way it's supposed to be at that stage of its development. But then eventually it's to come to full maturity and bear fruit. 
And the same with the work of atonement. Now, when when the thousand years are expired and and God's work of destroying the wicked is done, does that mean something further still happens to us? Do we receive yet another, um, you know, sort of advancement in in the judgment or um, to, to further, in other words, do we get further authentic, to be authenticated further by God after the wicked are destroyed or simultaneously as the wicked are destroyed, we also get a something higher or higher, you know, pronounced closer to God? Because there's, I mean, it's a, there's, something's obviously happening with the destruction of the wicked and um, the final coronation of Christ. Everything that has separated between us and God and everything that has caused doubt and every question that could cause, you know, uh, discontent is finally gone will will be finally gone and i don't think it'll be finally gone until until the wicked are completely destroyed after the millennium i think during the the thousand years even though we're we're sealed we're redeemed we're we're sure in, in our salvation in heaven and yet there'll be unanswered questions that god takes very seriously and and intends to to see every single one answered so that sin does not arise the second time. To, to get us to that point where sin really can never, will never come back requires an understanding that we won't even still fully have even by the second coming. We'll have all made our eternal decision, but there are still things that we will need to, to better understand. When we get to right. heaven, there'll be people there who, who we don't think should be there based on our, our experience with them on this earth. And there'll be people who aren't there who we thought for sure would be there, who we were counting on being there. And those questions need to be answered. And there were things that happened to us in this life that we don't understand that we need to understand to be fully reconciled to God. Is, is there any indication in the spirit of prophecy that when Jesus goes over the judgment with us, with the saints in heaven, that it would be wrong for us to have sympathy and say, you know, and ask God not to, not to um, go hard on them. Is there any indication in the spirit of prophecy that we that we could pray when we see their judgment, what God is, what what they have earned from God? Um, you know, do you think we could say, you know, please go easy on that person or whatever? Would that be wrong? Well, what would be the reason to go easy? Go, sympathy. go easy. So, so well, going easy was the sympathy that God wanted to give them was to completely forgive them of all their sin. But they have not accepted that. So are we going to then change the standard of judgment and punishment based on our own reasoning that we think is better than God's? Well, no, I know that God ultimately knows better than us, even, even okay. when, we are, when we are in our immortal state, God even knows better than us then too. Um, he mm -hmm. knows better than the angels, he knows better than the angels. There's, but would, would it be wrong for us to say that? You know? I, I don't think anybody who's there will say that. Okay. Well, so, <laughs> um, we'll accept that God's judgment is right. When we, when we are examining the cases and we're judging angels and judging the wicked mm -hmm. and, and meeting out the, the punishment, 
uh, that goes according to their works, we will be following one and only one standard and it won't be our, our own opinion. It will be the word of God. All of the standards of judgment are already found in the scriptures. Right, but we're going to see what they deserve for that. Yes, we'll, we're going... we'll understand that all the judgments that God gave in the Old Testament, especially, teach us about righteous judgment. Mm -hmm. the principles of righteous judgment. And those same principles will apply. We'll find that every sin is covered and every situation is covered by God's word. And we'll understand his word to where we'll be able to understand what the correct punishment is. Because I'm worried that it's going to be somebody that I know or that I knew of and that I liked. Well, I'm sure that there'll be such people there. But you don't think God would let us, would let us see that, do you? Is I God going to let sin off the hook? No, not just when, 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 when the came time for Jesus to suffer the penalty for our sins, did God lighten up on the penalty because he had sympathy for his son? No, he did not. He okay. didn't. So is he going to do no. that for your friend? Would it be right for him to do it? No, not if you no. use that measure of standard. No. There you go. No. It can't. It would undermine his law to do yes, so. Yes, it would. Yes, it would. It so, would. No, no, we don't want to do that, brother. We say yay and amen to God's judgment. The mercy has been offered, and God is still merciful. Not everybody will be punished the same. They're punished according to their works. You know, we're, uh, inspiration tells us that some will burn up as in a moment, while others will be burning for many days, she says. But for some, it's just a moment, like it's just a flash and they're gone. That sounds kind of merciful to me. It does, but... If you were going to have to be burned to death, did you want it in a flash or do you want it over many days? Well, I'd want it in, well, I'd want it in a flash, but okay. it's going to happen according to what, to what God decides through the, uh, through the principles of, um, of his judgment. That's right. Of the principle of sin and judgment. And, um, we'll see, you'll you know. see things about people. You'll see why they're not there. You'll see the opportunities that they had to make things right. And to choose right, and, and, you'll, I, see, and I, you'll see that they they don't want to be like God. You'll see all that, I, brother. I have a hard time thinking that that the Lord gives opportunity, the same kind of opportunity to everybody, because, um, I mean, I don't really know the, the people that are in my life. I don't know them to have been approached or to have had the experiences that I've had. God has worked and manifested They're not being in my life. The way you're being judged. Each, we're all judged individually, brother, based on what we knew and experienced and what we chose based on what we knew and experienced. God, all that's taken into account, brother. God is fair and just and perfect in every case. And we'll have done everything possible. And in fact, we'll, I'm sure one of the things we'll see is that everybody had not just one or two chances to do what was right, but they had untold number of chances over and over and over again. And consistently hardened their hearts not to choose right. You won't have any, all your doubts and questions will be answered, brother. You can rest assured. And I know that it's, I know it's the earthly part of me that's having sympathy for these people. It's not, I know it's not the higher part. It's the more earthly, yes. earthly, but I know that. I know it is because I see it 
Um, but, um, you know, I speak, I guess I'm speaking from my carnal mind. It's good, it's, I good still be, have. it's good to be pitiful and merciful to others because we understand and sympathize and, and we, we understand their weakness because of our own weakness. But we shouldn't sympathize with the sin. And right. everything, even, even the ones who will have to burn the longest, in, in the end, it's still God being merciful. They were going to be miserable. They, they were ne never, ever, ever, ever going to be happy and content. No, in heaven. No, I know. In no, heaven or anywhere. Even <clears throat> if they were allowed to have one world that was still sinful, they'd be miserable there. They're just not going to be happy. And the, the, the merciful thing to do is actually to make them be as they had never been. That's really what people are choosing. We didn't choose to come into existence, did we? No. I didn't. Did you? No. No. But we can choose to cease existing. Even that choice, God made the choice for us that to be in existence so that we could have the ability to choose. But one of the choices God gives us is to not exist, to go back to not existing. We can choose that. And actually, sadly, most people choose that. But it's definitely a clear choice. They don't want to choose what it, what it involves to be able to be happy and content forever with no disharmony ever. Even though if you actually did choose it, they would be happy. They're just so deceived. And they're so harm themselves by their own choices mm -hmm. our choices cause damage <laughs> cause oh, to damage ourselves. to our bodies cause damage to our minds i know i know and mm. eventually that damage can become irreparable but god god is able to heal all things but he can't force us and those who harden their hearts, he can't, can't do anymore. They have to be willing. Then see how it always comes down to the will. You're going to yield your will to his will or no. That's really uh, all that we can do. If we yield our will to his will, then he'll work out his will and good pleasure in us. And if we resist, then we're going to work out our own will and the sure results. Right. All right, it's getting kind of late. Before you go, Brenda Craig, I was looking for, oh, you closed it. I was in the letters in manuscript. I was trying to find where you were and I could not find uh that part of where you were in letters and manuscript, maybe it's in the wrong place. So it was letters and manuscript, and what was the subsection? Um, I mean, I can tell you the code here is nineteen. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on, hold on. Let me get to the right page. Uh, it's education. Nineteen. No, this is a letter. The last one was education. 19, uh, capital L, small t. L, t, uh-huh. Capital M, small s. M, s. So that, okay. that's, that's the shorthand for letters and manuscripts, volume 19. And okay. then comma, L, capital L, small t for letter. Mm -hmm. One, two, three. One, two, three. Comma. 1904. 1904. 
comma, okay. mm -hmm. P-A-R period, short for paragraph, P-A-R period, 29. Mm -hmm. 29, okay. So 19 LTMS, letters and manuscripts, letter 23, LT 23, 1904, paragraph 29. Okay, thank you. Is letters, is, is letters and manuscripts different from manuscript releases? I think manuscript releases is, is, is like a, probably like a subsection of letters and manuscripts. Okay, because there's 19 volumes of manuscript releases, you know. Yeah, I think there's probably more uh, volumes of letters and manuscripts. This is from 1904, volume 19, and she would have, they go all the way up to 1915, so. Okay. Letters and manuscripts is basically just all her letters and manuscripts compiled over the years, where manuscript releases is, is kind of partial selections taken from that that people think are important. Oh, so it's okay. partial then? Yeah, that's right. It's a compilation, okay, okay. essentially. Okay. Um, Thank you so much. Praise God. Uh, would someone be willing to close us in prayer? <clears throat> yeah, I will. Dear Father in heaven, dear Lord Jesus, thank you, Lord, for bringing the truth into these studies and bringing them out of the studies that help us, Lord, and help us realize things about ourselves and help us realize what you're trying to do for us, Lord Jesus. Father in heaven, I give thanks for the high and holy privilege to be at these studies. And I pray, dear Lord, that your uh, truth, your light and your wisdom will continue to be given to all of us. Thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.